in my editing guys will. Okay, great. Is there anything you don't want to discuss? Is there anything that sort of you, you, you're not keen on discussing at all? Are you mate, mate, if there's a question that, that I, I'm adverse to, to answer, I'll let you know, but most okay. topics are pretty, pretty open for me and I'll give you my honest opinions. Okay, cool. Great. Uh, so today I've got one of the health heroes in the podcast world. He's got the most incredible website. I've learned a lot from this man called Cribben Govender. And uh, it's just what a privilege and what an honor to have him on the Made to Thrive show. And I'm going to start the show with his, the, the way he starts his show. And uh, welcome to the Made to Thrive show, Cribben Govender. And who is Cribben Govender? Oh, wow. Th th thank you for the introduction, Stephen. It's, it's quite surreal to get that question flipped back onto me because that's how I start my show. And that's, it's a really open question. Yeah. So, and this is the first time I'm actually going to be answering that question, but mm. I'm essentially, I'm a food scientist. I'm a, a business owner of Nourish Me Organics, a, a husband and a father, and really someone who's on a journey to awaken people when it comes to the strategies that they can use to improve their health and especially mental health because mental health is something that is deeply, deeply important to me because I struggled heavily with anxiety and depression severely for most of my life. And I've been trying to find the tools along my journey to deal with it. And I've essentially got many, many tools in the toolkit to address it. I mean, my, my mental health is not, it's not perfect by any means of the uh, imagination, but it has improved out of this world with the things that I've learned. So essentially that in a nutshell, I'm just a person that's really on a, on a journey of discovery. Good. Good. I want to dig deeper a little into your story. Cause I know that you had a sort of a traumatic uh, episode in your life and then you developed how important the gut is with mental health. So tell us a little bit about your specific uh, story. Yeah, Steve, about, it's 10 years ago now, like probably 2010, where my life really, really just collapsed. I mean, I was pretty successful in terms of my career and education and all that kind of stuff, the journey to develop a family, a lifestyle, all that kind of stuff was really successful. But I just... And when I think back, my, my struggle with things, I mean, it all collapsed in 2010. But when I think back, it was around in childhood when I was a, a child and I'd gone to, to, a, to a trip overseas with my parents to India. And I got extremely, extremely ill with food poisoning during that particular trip. I picked up a bug called Shigella dysentery. And I'd, I'd come back to Australia and I was literally going to the toilet like it would have been like seven times a day. Literally, I couldn't hold any food down. I lost most, I've lost 10 kilos. I was already a, a waif, super skinny in that. And I lost a further 10 kilos. It was like a skeleton. But the doctors put me on a very, very strict regimen of antibiotics. And it literally, when I think back now, I know what happened. It decimated my gut and my microbiome. And we'll, we can talk about that later, what that is. But essentially, I went from this pretty happy-go-lucky character, you know, bubbly kid, very popular, to being someone that was dark, gloomy, depressed, really a, a 180 shift in my behavior. And it was quite profound, like extremely profound. And so I carried this, this struggle with being continuously anxious and then developing depression and things like that through my life. But I think once my career started to progress, the level of stress drastically accelerates. So I found myself in kind of more senior roles. And in, in those particular roles, my, the stress just got to me. My whole life collapsed. I literally found myself, I, you know, I've got three beautiful children. My wife and I separated I ended up in an apartment in the city on my, by my, myself and really re ready to end my life. It was that, that desperate. 
So I sat there and you know, really it was close. I was literally looking over the edge. It was that close in terms of how, how serious it was. And fortunately, the thing that really saved my life is the fact that I've got three beautiful young boys and I did not want to leave that legacy for them. So I, I got my, my, my strength up. I started to research how can I tackle this struggle with mental, with this mental delimitation and um, found many tools, many, many tools. But the most important thing, and you mentioned that before, Steve, was the very, very significant connection between the gut and the brain. So that's, that's the story in a nutshell. Yeah, good. So what I want to ask you is the chasm between how important our gut function is and our microbiome and our mental health, especially in South Africa and Africa, is significant. I mean, is it really true that your microbiome, your gut microbiome affects your mental health and well-being? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, the microbiome in itself is only a recent discovery, I think, the studies were happening in full swing probably around 2000, probably mid-2000s, I'd say, 2005 to 2007 or something like that. But it was really around 2014 when a lot of mainstream media and, and more, more of the mainstream started to report on this, these findings. Yeah. And then as the studies have progressed, we're still very early days. I mean, it's the microbiome is th this collection of, of microbes, whether it's bacteria, yeast, fungi, parasites, archaea, viruses. It's a, a two kilogram organ that's actually mainly in the gut, but there's different mm. accesses throughout axes, I should say, throughout the body, whether it's mm. the gut gut brain axis or the, you know, the gut lung or the, and then there's also these other areas where there's microbes, whether it's the mouth or the nose or the, the mm. private parts, you know, skin, they all have their own mm. individual mm. microbiomes, but science mm. is very, very, very specific now in that, that connection between the gut and the brain and the microbes having the ability to produce neurotransmitters, which can communicate directly through the vagus nerve to the brain. So how you feel is a huge part of it is what's going on in the gut. So there's a very definite connection and science is developing very rapidly in that space. I want the listeners to hear that and uh, the audience on YouTube, that there's a body of research, there's science now showing that the microbiome, your gut microbiome, affects your well-being, affects your mental health, affects your clarity of thought, affects just the way you function in all aspects of cognition. So I do want to dive into your story. You did all the research. What did you end up doing? Tell us. Mm. That's a good question, Steve. In initially, it was, I mean, being a scientist, having that background in science, it was, it was pretty, it was almost pretty seamless for me to jump into the research and starting to look at what sort of evidence there is in that space on, you know, the gut brain and all that kind of stuff. And I started to come up with papers and see it. But the seminal piece of work that really got me started was reading a book called The Gaps, The Gaps book, which is, mm. I think it's Gastrointestinal Psychological Syndrome by mm. Natasha Campbell McBride. And she talks contextually about her child and using different dietary strategies to impact how the child functions from a neurological perspective, mm -hmm. cognition, mood, things like that. And she demonstrated very clearly in that book that there is a connection between the gut and the brain. And by modulating the diet and shifting the diet, you can impact how you feel and your psychological functions. So I started to use some of those strategies. So I went into a GAPS diet, very strict GAPS diet for about three, three or four months. 
I started to incorporate things like bone broth. I started to cut out things like grains and, and excessive amounts of carbs and processed foods and junk foods and all anything that was artificial, I cut out of the diet. And then I started to introduce fermented foods later on and specifically one that is absolutely a game changer for anybody that wants to improve their mental health is a product called milk kefir and milk kefir. There's a lot of fake products that are coming onto the supermarket shelves, but to make, to, to get real milk kefir, you have to make it yourself with the kefir grains, but it's a very easy product to make. It's literally, it takes you 24 hours. And once you get a hold of kefir grains, you can make milk kefir with milk and kefir grains for life, forever. These grains are reusable. So once you do it, I mean, they keep on growing. So it's the most powerful probiotic and certainly the most economical probiotic and scientifically backed fermented food on the planet. And the way milk kefir works, it's a couple of different ways it works. Firstly, it, it helps with the production of tryptophan. So when you look at the, the nutritional components of milk kefir, it is loaded with probiotic bacteria. You're talking 2 trillion probiotic organisms per serve of this product that you make at home that costs nothing, just milk. Then you've got all these, these neurotransmitters like GABA, a very important calming neurotransmitter is, that is very abundant in milk kefir. You've got prebiotics, which are substances that feed other bacteria. And I mentioned it before, just unbelievable amounts of tryptophan. And why tryptophan is important is because tryptophan is a precursor molecule for serotonin. Mm. And serotonin is this feel-good neurotransmitter so what happens is tryptophan through a, a whole series of biochemical reactions, it's very complex. Mm. It also needs just on a, on a side, you need morning sunlight to actually start mm. the conversion process between tryptophan into serotonin. And then finally mm. serotonin gets converted into melatonin, which is mm. your sleep hormone. So you're talking about this cascade of hormones which is pretty much starting from a dietary component, milk kefir, mm. light exposure. So, you know, then I, then I started to explore other things aside from diet. I started to, to go into, you know, like I went, obviously I went to see a psychologist. That's the first most obvious thing you do. And the psychologist mm. took me through a series of exercises they taught me how to meditate. So I started to learn how to do transcendental meditation. I started to do yoga. I started to do acting training. I started to look at conquering fears. Mm. And the biggest fear, you know, something that was really holding me back. I mean, before I started podcasting and all that, I mean, I was terrified of being in front of people, whether it's in front of a camera, whether it's in front of a public speaking event. It was the biggest fear that I've ever had. And one of, one of the most liberating things that I ever did for my mental health was to actually learn how to act, <laughs> going into an acting class. Wow. And because acting, really learning how to act is not learning how to pretend. Learning how to act is learning more about yourself and learning about all these different parts of you and dealing with trauma. It's psychology. Acting is all mm. psychology. So going through a whole year of acting training really helped me to break through all these blockages, psychologically fears like public speaking and learning the tools on how to, how to actually conquer those fears. And at the end of that course, that acting training that I did for a year, I did a, I was on stage in a theater production in front of 300 people. So it was hugely, hugely liberating. And all those skills that I've learned, I obviously use now in my podcasting. I've done some commercial work in acting and things like that as well. So it's all, it's all a journey, right? So it's not just one thing, Steve. It's multiple, multiple things mm. that really helped me to overcome my mental, mental health struggles. 
but diet is diet, exercise, yoga, electromagnetic radiation, light therapy, cold therapy. There's so many tools in the toolkit mm. being, that, that have really helped me. And these practices I pretty much use every single day. I have cold, sh- uh, cold showers every day. I, tr- I used to jump in the ocean once a week, but now I'm in lockdown, so I'm stuck at my house <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in Melbourne. Yeah, but I think what you're saying is that the, what moved the needle the most was getting your gut health good. You know, starting with the kefir and that built up some neurotransmitters within your gut, within your body, within your brain that moved the needle significantly that you possibly could go to do acting classes and work that out. It obviously yeah. helped your work with the psychologist. So I do feel that the, the audience need to hear how important their gut is, what they put in, whether it's processed food, whether it's junk food, whether it's, you know, your your poofers now that are causing a lot of, you know, research and science and a big hoo-ha, you know, in uh, social media circles, you know, all your oils, your, your processed oils, your vegetable oils, your canola oils, those type of oils that damage the gut. That was a significant move for you. That was yeah. the game changer that started things. And that's why you've got a, a podcast called The Gut Health Gurus and why you've got a store called Nourish Me Organics. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's Nourish Me. I mean, it yeah. starts with... The most simplest thing, I mean, it's, it's a gradient, it's a spectrum. There's, there's these different steps, right? So the most simplest step is diet and lifestyle changes. Mm. I mean, you always start with the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah. What are the things that you, they're going to be very simple to change. And then the additional strategies are really percentage imp- improvements, yeah. but to get from, 1% improvement to 80% improvement, it's really simple, mm. super simple. Jerf, just eat real food, real food from scratch. That is the easiest thing to, to incorporate. Stop, mm. stop going to the supermarket and buying all the box nonsenses. Get fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, the cleanest water you can afford you know, everything as clean as possible. And that's going to take you unimaginable amounts in terms of improvements. Mm. The most, this is this, obviously, if you asked me this question two years ago, it would be very different because I'm continuously learning, but where the latest science is in terms of the microbiome is the impact of circadian rhythmicity on the microbiome composition. Now, let me explain. So circadian rhythmicity is your body being yoked to the day and night cycle, particularly the sun. So what disrupts circadian rhythmicity, I think most significantly is EMF radiation. So it's your artificial lightings, it's your Wi-Fi signals, your Bluetooth it's, it's shifting the environment that's interfering and creating stresses in the body that the body is not accustomed to after millions of years of, of development through its evolutionary process. So this non-native field is interrupting all your hormones, your melatonin hormones, cortisol hormones. It's a stressor. So that's the first thing that's very easy to just, when you're going to sleep, turn off your Wi-Fi router. Very easy. You're not using it. Put your phone in airplane mode. It's pretty easy, right? Then you start to manage your light, waking up in the morning, getting sunlight in your eyes. Again, that's going to set the circadian rhythmicity because you have to remember the body has a clock when it secretes different hormones. If you're sitting in the dark with a cell phone shining in your eyes with all this blue light, blue lights, just, just, just think white light. That's blue light. Mm. The, the blaring iPhone blazing in your eyes. And instead of your body thinking this is sleep time, it's thinking it's in the middle of the day. So it disrupts the circadian rhythm and the microbiome itself has a circadian rhythm. Different organisms are active at different parts of the day. So you need some organisms early in the day and you need different ones in the middle of the day and at the end of the day, there's a rhythm. But when the rhythm is disrupted, 
this neuroendocrine organ, this two kilo organ, which is literally from, from a, a numbers level, it's roughly 50, 50, your cell to a micro a bacterial cell, I should say, mm. so 50, 50. But from a genetic point of view, it's like you're, you're 90 plus percent. It's even higher, 90 plus percent mm. microbe. You're mu there's much more microbial genes in your body mm. than your own genes. So mo most of your genes are not yours. Mm. They're exogenous. They're, they're from outside. They're these organisms. And it's the only organ in the body that is purely adaptive, like 100% adaptive to stimuli, whether it's circadian rhythmicity, whether it's your food sources, it can shift and adapt. And it's one of the most important reasons why we can adapt, why as humans we're so resilient, we can adapt to pretty much any environment because the microbiome can fill in the gaps that you need. They produce hormones, they produce vitamins, minerals, they're 80% of your immune system. So it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. But coming back to circadian rhythmicity, so you need to be yoked to the sun. So it's very easy. So you get sunlight in your eyes in the morning. At midday, you get another exposure from the sun. Get it on your skin, your face, your eyes. And then when it comes to the nighttime, wear blue light blocking glasses, limit screen time at night. You can, there's modes on your phone that you can play with to start to kill the blue light. But what I find is the easiest way is I just whack on some blue light blocking glasses. And then that allows my body because melatonin production doesn't start at, in the night. The precursor molecules, as I mentioned, start when that moment when that sunlight hits your eyes you start to produce POMC. It's a compound called POMC. It's an acronym for a long chemical name, POMC. But POMC goes through a conversion, multiple conversions, tryptophan, serotonin. Then eventually the last one in that cycle is melatonin. So you need to have this. And melatonin, I would say, is aside from glutathione, melatonin is like this master antioxidant. I mean, it's so important for so many different chemical, biochemical reactions in the body. And that sleep, so coming back full circle, that lifestyle leads itself to getting the proper amount of sleep and high quality sleep because that just, you know, just, you're, you're pretty much recovering, you're detoxifying, your brain is detoxifying during that sleeping process. So, and your gut is repairing you literally have a new gut every couple of days. Like, I mean, it's, it's so, it's, it's a it's tissue that's continuously being regenerated because mm. it is the biggest defense to the outside world. It's not the skin. The number one interface to the outside world is the gut. Mm. The gut, think about the gut. Think about your body as two tubes. You got an outer tube, which is the skin, and the inner tube is your gut. So whatever is sitting inside the gut is outside the body. It's sitting outside. And the easiest way I can explain this is think about like a drug trafficker. Drug trafficker that swallows the bag of drugs. And he smuggles it through a country and he poos it out. And then he can, or whatever he's trying to smuggle. Because it's outside the body. It's not inside the body. It's going through the gut and you're pooping it out. You're not digesting it. So hence, that's why the gut is so critical. So I've jumped all over the place. So you might, you might want to bring me good. back and explore. No, no problem. Areas. I think there's a, there's a lot of information there. And I think it's just exciting how important the circadian rhythm is, how important uh, natural sunlight is in your eyes, because unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation, you know, with regards to how damaging the sun is. In fact, the sun is probably one of the most important parts of our lives. Our so function, important. our health, our microbiome. And a lot of this work comes out of Dr. Jack Cruz, who we're both a big fan of. Yeah. So we'll link to, uh, you know, the Nourish, the Gut Health Gurus podcast with Dr. Jack Cruz in our show yeah. notes. Also, Andy Mann from Blue Blocks. Uh, yeah. We use his blue blocking glasses. So yep. well, there's a lot of crossover between myself and the Gut Health Gurus podcast. 
as well as Nourish Me Organics. But I do want to delve into a little bit, a bit of the deeper details on kefir because I know it's a dairy product. Uh, tell me a bit more if someone's got a dairy intolerance. Are there other options for kefir? And then I want to talk about kombucha after that. Yes, certainly. I mean, milk kefir is the gold standard in terms of the probiotic benefits, the, the functional peptides, which are literally just small bits of protein that have biological effects on the body. There's, there's things like the ability to lower cholesterol, there's lowering blood pressure, there's obviously the neurotransmitter components. There's all these anti, antimicrobial having the ability to knock out salmonella or some listeria and some other nasty pathogens, ability to knock out helicobacter pylori. So there's proven scientific benefits to these functional peptides. But the functional peptides itself, they're postbiotics. So postbiotics are what the bacteria themselves produce or, or the yeast. So the, these compounds that they produce that have the benefits. So the probiotics are the live organisms, but the postbiotics are the ones that are doing most of the work. So hence, it's very important from a kefir perspective to, if, if I was going to recommend something with science is to use the dairy based version with a very high quality milk. So something preferably with a, with, with primarily a two milk proteins, the non inflammatory type milk proteins, whether it's organic, biodynamic, chemical free, small herd, not these mass produced commercial products with lots of chemicals, just a very pure milk source, goat's milk, that's going to be your best, best option. Okay. Gold standard in terms of science. You can use like water kefir grains to, and it's basically, it's just, this is someone that's vegan that doesn't, doesn't tolerate dairy products or they have a, an intolerance to casein. I should mention if you're, if you're lactose intolerant, milk kefir is going to be fine because the lactose is converted into lactic acid. So the bacteria actually reduce the lactose to such a small level that it's not going to trigger a lactose intolerance reaction. I'm lactose intolerant. I don't have any problems with, with milk kefir. So if you have some dietary restrictions or limitations with dairy, and certainly the early parts of the GAPS diet, I think they do recommend going dairy-free, grain-free, carb-free, all that kind of stuff. So kefir comes very late into the GAPS protocol anyway. But there is water kefir. So water kefir is, is a very different organism. So milk kefir comes from the Caucasus region in central Eurasia. It's thousands of years old. There's mentions of it in the Bible. It's just been passed down from many generations to generations. It's not made in the lab. It's just something that's been handed down for thousands of years from the Caucasus region. Water kefir most likely came from Central America, Mexico. That's, that's, the evidence, uh, the, the best evidence that I found is somehow someone opened a uh, fruit and they found these grains inside of it. And grains are really, it's not like a plant grain. It's a biofilm. It's a bacterial biofilm. It's literally bits of sugars that the bacteria secrete and they make these almost like little crystals called kefir grains. So water kefir is a great option for someone that is dairy free. You can put it into coconut water and ferment it, or you can ferment it in sugar and water. Most of the sugar is removed in the fermentation. It's converted into organic acids. You can use kefir grains, water and milk kefir grains. You can use it with nut milks. So you can make soy milk kefir, or almond milk kefir, whatever, okay. coconut milk kefir. It's very versatile. Okay, great. That sounds excellent. And uh, if someone is doing well with their kefir, do they need to take probiotics? Are you a probiotic fan? I mean, is there, is there any case that you can take too many probiotics or prebiotics? It seems to be the rage here where every second person's on probiotics and prebiotics. The way I approach it, Steve, is it's very personalized. 
So generally speaking, I think having a dietary source of fermented foods in every meal is very advantageous. So it's almost like you're prophylactic. So it's something that you're taking just to maintain good wellness and good health. With probiotics, after you go through some sort of metagenomic analysis, analysis of your stool, you get, get a stool profile, you look at the deficiencies in different species of bacteria, then you can use therapeutic interventions with probiotics and prebiotics. So okay. you can use specific strains, something like a Nysol strain of E. coli, mm -hmm. or you can use a VSL number three, which is the most clinically tested probiotic preparation on the planet. So VSL three, you can use something like seed, which is another good one where they're just a consortia of different probiotic bacteria, but they're more so or, or mega spore biotic, which is a, which is a, a spore based probiotic again with lots of good studies for leaky guts and all sorts of things like that. Now there's, there's therapeutic strains that are specifically selected for mental health. So you can get strains that will help with mental health issues. So it's, it's very, very tailored to the individual person. But I would say that broadly speaking, fermented foods are very cost effective, easy to implement. And I really recommend having a fermented food in every meal. So your breakfast, you could be having some milk kefir with some berries then at lunchtime, you could be having a bit of sauerkraut on the side, a glass of water kefir, a glass of kombucha, a bit of miso, miso soup, natto, mm. tempeh, kimchi. There's, there's so many, amaz amazake, so many, many different fermented foods you have to choose. There's thousands. Cheese, yogurts, they're all fermented foods. Chocolate, it's fermented food. Coffee, fermented food. Cheese, the best food, glass of red wine. So you got lots of options. Yeah, great. And that's a better option than supplementation. But what you are saying, if you are struggling, work with a health coach or a health advocate or work with a natural practitioner or a doctor of Chinese medicine to try and help you if that road where you've used all these fermented foods, which you can in every single meal, have not solved your gut issue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. And I really recommend looking at the practitioner only probiotics. Mm. I mean, these are the ones that have got science behind it. Mm. They've got clinical studies. The ones that you pick up from the supermarket shelf, they don't have the same rigor. They're much mm. cheaper, but are they going to be as efficacious as using a therapeutic practitioner only brand and product? Mm. So Good. hence that's why working with a, with a naturopath mm. or a practitioner, you get access to these particular products. Mm -hmm. Great. Tell us a little bit about the science of kombucha. You know, I've picked that up from your podcast and I've seen it on your website and, uh, you know, watched a few sort of, uh, you know, interviews that you've done on kefir and kombucha. Tell me what's happening with kombucha and is it for everyone? Kombucha, I think it's, n it's not particularly well studied. I'll put that out mm. straight away. Mm. I mean, there is some some evidence to suggest that it could be helping from an organic acids perspective on blood sugar modulation. So definitely could be having that benefit. I, I definitely think also for my research that the, the organic acids, gluconic acid that's produced in the fermentation, glucuronic acid, acetic acid act as prebiotics in the gut. So I don't think it's a probiotic per se, they might be, there might be big, big inverted commas. There might be Saccharomyces boulardii. There might be, but yeah. no one's actually proven it that I've actually seen it. There might be Saccharomyces boulardii. There certainly is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So these are kind of beneficial yeast species, but it's not like a milk kefir. Like a milk kefir, you've got a hundred strains. 30 to 100, depending on the study you look at, of probiotic bacteria and yeast. 100%. Yeah, it's, gonna, it's 
it's worked, it's tried and tested. There's human clinical trials. There's preclinical animal studies. We've got evidence and it's been used mm. for thousands of years. It's an amazing product. Mm. Kombucha is a little, little bit on the, on, on the edge in terms of its, its efficiency as being beneficial from a probiotic perspective. Mm. Mm. But you know what, okay. Steve? So much better than soft drinks, so much yeah. better than artificial products. It's homemade. It's literally just fermented tea. It takes about yeah. seven days to make it home. Really cost effective. Don't get sucked in too much to the commercial ones because a lot of them are just sugary water with flavors and additives. If you're going to have kombucha, make it yourself at home. Or find a brand that you can trust that actually does it the proper way. It is very difficult to make real kombucha because of the alcohol percentage from a commercial perspective. So it's very unlikely that the ones on the shelves are going to be the real deal. So best to make it yourself. Great. I've heard that uh, Australia's water is not good at all from Dr. Jack Cruz yeah. and uh, just the Terrible. deuterium content. And yeah. you know, I do want to find out about, you said clean water, and I think that's very, very important. I think we've discussed how important, you know, just probiotics are, how important kefir is, making sure you have fermented food. But tell us about water. I do want to talk about that. I don't even know about the water status from a de deuterium point of view in South Africa. I've still got to do those tests, try and find the experts in South Africa to find out you know, what the deuterium content is. What is deuterium number one? How important is it to drink um, deuterium depleted water and what is happening in Australia? Yeah. And Cruz is, Cruz is being pretty, pretty scathing on the, the water in Australia, but the water in Australia has a couple of issues. Number one, the deuterium content is by far, in my mind, it's just, just a geographical anomaly. It's, it's around 154. We've done extensive testing. Our laboratory does extensive testing on, on deuterium contents of multiple water sources. But deuterium, all it is, is, is an isotope of hydrogen. So it's just got more molecular weight. So it can substitute into hydrogen in chemical reactions, but from a weight perspective, it's got twice the mass. It's got an extra neutron. Mm. So, so instead of having H2O, which is water, two hydrogens and oxygen, you can end up with various configurations, but the most obvious is D2O. But the problem is that deuterium... I was, I'm being very lucky. I've, I've spoken to Dr. Jack Cruz, but I've also spoken to Gabor Shomlai. I spent time with Gabor Shomlai in, in Hungary. And I've also spent time on, video, on, on a video conference with, with um, Dr. Laszlo Boros. So Dr. Laszlo Boros, Gabor Shomlai, they're the experts in the world. And basically what they're saying is that deuterium can interfere with various reactions in the body, but the most obvious one is within the mitochondria, which is the energy producing organelles in the body. Mm. So what Dr. Laszlo Borash suggests is that excessive levels of environmental deuterium coming through our food, food or, or water, primarily water, damages these nanomotors I'm not sure how much you know about the nanomotors yeah, yeah, in the yeah. mitochondria. So hence, if you, you know, the, the most dense tissues have, I think about 10,000 mitochondria. So if you imagine, mm. and the best analogy to think about the impact of mitochondria is if you think about if someone was going to invade a particular country, Steve, what would you think would be the first targets they would hit? Well, they got to hit the walls. Got to get out the walls. You know, if you're gonna, if you can't get the outer barrier, you, you you're yeah. in trouble. Yeah. Anything else you can think of? Well, anything that's going to produce resources. You know, yeah. Energy that's going to produce energy and resources. That's it. Like a power plant, right? Yeah. So you hit yeah. the power plants. So that's exactly what happens when your mitochondria is dysfunctional. 
the mitochondria, think about your heart or think about your brain. They're very dense with mitochondria. So if the mitochondria are being whacked out in your brain cells, do you think the brain is going to function to its full capacity if it's not getting the energy? No. No. This is, this is which, what could be potentially happening with neuro dysfunction and you know, neurological diseases. Mm. This, this is what happens in the gut. The gut cells, the lining, they have mitochondria. The mitochondria, the early warning systems, the mitochondria are actually the first line of defense in the immune system. They're the sensing organelles in those little gut cells. So think about having deuterium, excessive levels of deuterium through the diet or through the water and damaging those mitochondria inside the gut cells. Could this be leading to dysfunctions like leaky gut? Mm. So this is the impact of deuterium. But deuterium also messes around with, with topology. I mean, okay. in nature, a lot of the way that things function is through shape. So enzymes have a particular shape. A lot of shape is involved in the way reactions occur, the cells function, the barrier systems, you know, whether it's a phospholipid barrier or some barrier system like that. So anything that's going to be impacting a shape of a molecule could potentially cause dysfunction. And if you consider that deuterium is twice as heavy, it's going to be causing some potential distortions in, mm. in shape of, of different mm. tissues or even molecules. So do you import your water in from where if you, uh, yeah. or, yeah. or uh, is that, where do you get it from, from a deuterium depleted water? Is it a way that we could get it in South Africa for people that are really not well? I know that crew spoke about the ketogenic diet being a deuterium depleting diet, number one, and then yeah. getting the right water in Australia. Where do you get it from and uh, where can people in South Africa get this deuterium depleted water? That's a really good question. The easiest way, and you touched on it already, is diet. Because carbohydrates tend to be having higher levels of deuterium. And maybe what we can do is link to our guide because we wrote, I, I think, and, and Ben agrees, Ben Greenfield, who we spoke to originally, it's, it's one of the best guides in deuterium depletion, deuterium science ever written, comprehensive guide. Because I've done so much testing on different water sources and we have, we, we have access to data on food, we can show you the deuterium content of different food products and also different water sources. So that's probably the easiest to just link to that guide. Okay. But just talking on the top of my head, fats tend to be lower in deuterium. Things like lard and bacon fat are lower in deuterium. Whereas grains and wheat and carbohydrates and all these starchy foods tend to be higher in deuterium. So the easiest way you mentioned is to have some sort of ketogenic diet. So using a ketogenic diet and then also exposing the body to, especially there's, there's different sun cycles, light in the morning, light at midday, potentially even if you have the time, light at sunset or from the sun. And even using techniques like red light therapy, using a, a red light panel. Mm. Your question on water, because I did so much testing on all these deuterium sources around the world, I literally tested just about every single country. And I found a source very high in the mountains in Canada. So what I did, I was so excited when I did the testing. I literally told my wife, we're getting on a plane and going to meet these guys. So we literally arranged the meeting. I jumped on a plane, flew to Canada up to this pristine glacial source, spent an absolute fortune and just to lock in this source mm. and imported all this water into Australia. So I have, I actually created my own brand. It's called low D, but the low D is actually water, from this glacial source, the most pristine, purest, no glyphosate, no chlorine, no fluoride. It is literally a low deuterium. It's 136 ppm deuterium. 
the lowest natural water deuterium content on the planet ever tested. That's where I was so excited. When I saw that number come out from the analysis, I realized that this is the, the most amazing water product on the planet. Mm. And it's from a natural source. And it's the same price that we normally can buy bottled water from the shop. It's not, not any more expensive. Mm. Having said that, there is Dr. Gabor Shomulai and, and Laszlo Borosh where they deal with cancer patients. Because a lot of the deuterium studies are done on cancer and slowing the growth of cancerous cells. So what we did is we formed a partnership with Gabor Shomlai in Hungary and his brand is called Preventa. And Preventa is the market leader when it comes to using deuterium depleted water as an oncology treatment. You can use it for diabetes, you can use it for for cancer, but obviously I make no claims on that. I mean, mm. we, we just have it as a water supply, but you can look at Dr. Gabor Shomliai's work and his research and Laszlo Borish's work and research. They're both very credible scientists, very well-respected scientists. So you can look at their work to understand the science behind it. Mm. But the point is Preventa, they use a fractional distillation process to get that deuterium level down to about 25 ppm but they have to use incredible amounts of energy to achieve that. And I've seen, I've actually gone to their factory. It's four layers, four levels of, of uh, distillation technology used in the oil industry. So it's this very old energy intensive process, but it gets the level down to about 25. So a lot of these, these sick people dilute the water to anywhere between say 80 to 120 ppm but that's more if you're really sick that's when you use that level and so we import preventa and look we we sell out of that product it's extremely expensive but because it's so effective against particular illnesses we have quite a substantial customer base that are willing to pay that price but it's a very expensive order so low D is more for Aussie consumers. It's, it's, it's a couple of bucks a bottle. I mean, it's not expensive. But what I am hearing you saying, Kevin, is that how important your water is because you've gone mm. and all the way to Canada. You've now spent time with Sporus and all these guys that are, you know, specialists in this field. Uh, how important is water? Are you, are you saying it's as important as, you know, the, getting out in the sun? Are you saying as important as food? Is it, where does it sit? Number one. Because the reason why I say that is because it's about, I think about 70% of your body is water. So think about it, you know, like water, we're learning more and more about water. Water is an incredibly important molecule. The research is suggesting that water is almost like a, like a hard drive. It's stored. It's like a, it's still, it's, it's got memory. I mean, there's, there's lots of research on this. A lot of it's esoteric and some of it's a bit woo woo, but I have seen a lot of credible scientists talk about this as well. Water holds memory. So hence, if that water you're drinking out of your tap is going through all these, all these, these processing and plants and they, they have chlorine and they've got fluoride and they've got all the, it could have hormones. You make some water sources are actually recycled from, from water that you're flushing down the toilet. So, I mean, it depends on your water source, but, but think about the memory that that water is holding versus a source that's coming from a glacier or from mm. an aquifer. And I take my water very serious. And I've never talked about this on a podcast, but I actually, I structure my water before I drink it. So I use my low D water, but what I do is I use, I've got a secret method. I can't really talk about it, <laughs> but, but what I do is I, I use some technology to actually erase the memory of the water. And then you can structure it and structuring is easy. You can use, you can put it in the sun, you can 
use a red light panel with infrared light and red light. Some people vortex as well. They're vortex. I use a combination of different things, but I structure that water. So I have more of this. I'm not sure you've seen the work of Ger Gerald Pol Pollock. The yeah, fourth phase, yeah, of, fourth water. phase of water. Yeah. 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 So a and lot of that easy water. Yeah. Easy exclusion zone water. That's more absorbable in the body. So I use these techniques and technologies to very simply create exclusion zone structured water. And every glass of water goes through that process before it goes into my body. And it's a hundred percent pure. So not distilled water. I mean, it's, natural water mm. from an act yeah. from an, a glacier okay sounds incredibly interesting and i think we've got to get some of your skills i don't know how to test the water from a deuterium point of view in south africa but maybe we can have a chat afterwards and just look at uh, how important the water sources are for south africans and for africans in general but tell me a little bit more about your interest in terms of the sun circadian rhythm and how it sort of uh, it causes exclusion zone water in the mitochondrial sort of inner mitochondrial membrane. So you're now drinking deuterium depleted water, which is excellent. You're now getting into the sun and that causes your easy water. Is that correct? Yeah. So exposure to the infrared spectrum is, is what's going to trigger this, this exclusion zone water. So hence getting out in the sun, you know, Cruz talks about it extensively, getting out, getting skin in the game, going down to the beach when you can, when you're not locked down, you can you know, deliberately make a concerted effort to spend time in nature. There's negative ions as well, which is very un underappreciated neurological effects on the body too. You, know, you ever wonder why, the Japanese do forest bathing and it, mm -hmm. or sometimes when you spend time in a park or you spend time in a forest or you spend time in the beach, there's something magical about it. It's all one of the reasons is because of mm -hmm. these negative ions. So that's another really effective tool to improve your mental health, just going down to the beach, going to the park or going to a forest. So, and so to answer your question, the main thing with exclusion zone water is going to be the infrared light in the sun. Specifically, yeah. you know, a lot of these, these, especially around midday is when you get some UV light as well. So the, all these things contribute to these biological effects on, in the water, actually inside the body and the tissue. Mm -hmm. But one point I would add, which I forgot to add earlier, would say if water was number one, Number two, I would say, is a confined eating window. So what you find, if you want to improve, this is the 80%, eat clean food and water. The next thing I would say is confine your eating window. It's going to sound like I'm crazy, but try and confine it to six to eight hours a day. It's not as hard as you think. The reason why is because we've been mentally conditioned to over consume. We've been conditioned to continuously be consuming food, snacking, eating continuously. If you can confine within say from 9am to 5pm, just confine your eating during that time. This is when you give your gut a chance to actually rest and digest because eating is cortisol. It's stressful. It's hugely energy intensive. It's taxing on the immune system. So one of the simplest things is just stop eating. Give, your give the food that you've actually consumed a chance to actually digest. Give your body the chance to actually absorb the nutrients from the food. And then, especially at least, I would say four hours before bed, no eating because eating again is going to interfere with melatonin production. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is when your body is trying to flush out all these toxins out of your brain and, and flush out toxins out of your body, you still worry about digesting food. Mm. So Fantastic. this is like these little tiny tweaks, clean food, clean water, circadian rhythmicity, small confined eating window, 
intermittent fasting. Essentially what you're doing is intermittent mm. fasting is a 16 hour. You're going to see some amazing benefits because you actually are letting your body do its job. You're yeah. getting out the way and actually allowing your body to really do its job and work for you and not getting in its way. Well, fantastic. And it's just, you know, I think we've been just blessed today by Cribben and all his information from circadian rhythm to kefir to kombucha to uh, fasting, which uh, at Made to Thrive, we are big fans. We have a lot of blogs on Made to Thrive. Sash and Panda's work on circadian rhythm and when to eat is so mm. important. I've seen my data on my ordering improve uh, dramatically when I eat when the sun is out. When the sun goes down, you stop eating and give yourself at least four hours. I totally agree with that. And I've seen my deep sleep scores, my REM sleep scores improve, my HRV improve. And so I do want to talk about two last uh, sort of areas. You've been so generous with your time, Kevin. Thank you so much. There's so much value. I mean, I'm going to link to Patrick van der Bert. He's, he's been mm. on your show. He's been yeah. on my show about EMF. I mean, there's just so many links in our show notes here because we've covered such a vast array of topics. But the first thing I want to talk about, your morning routine. I know Dr. Jack Cruz speaks about how important the sunrise is. Is it morning light? Is it the sunrise? Tell us about your morning routine. It's pretty simple. I'm, I'm a stickler for routine, actually. So normally I wake up around 7.30. It's, it's actually hard to wake up because I, I fully black out. I should let you know as well. My house is... Patrick actually did it. Patrick hardwired my, he, he was the one that was responsible. He did the assessment in my house. Okay. He came in, we, we got rid of all the, the dirty electricity. We put switches in, kill switches to kill different light circuits. So mm. my room has literally after a certain time period, zero EMF. I don't have Wi-Fi in my house. Everything is hardwired by ethernet. So Wi-Fi got banned a few years ago from my household. So no one has Wi-Fi. So all my kids have Ethernet ports in their room. So they just plug into the Ethernet. So there's no Wi-Fi. So, and, and then my, my room is blacked out. So it's really hard to wake up because it's like I'm sleeping in a black cave. <laughs> so, so normally I set an alarm for myself around 7.30. I wake up, I, get, I go downstairs and I, um, the first thing I do is Put, put my tackies, I'll talk the South African way, I'll put my tackies yeah. on and uh, go for a walk in the sun. So I normally t take a walk down to my local cafe, which is about 20 minutes to get to. And the sun is rising around that time. So I'm getting this beautiful amount of, of light hitting my eyes. I'm getting some exercise, some just some brisk walking, some exercise. But then what's really important, because I do a lot of my work alone, is I have a bit of a chat with my barista. So I'm having some form of human interaction, mm. having a bit of chat, have a chat, some social interaction to get my day started. I come back, I do 20 minutes of, of um, the transcendental meditation. But I also, and it sounds like a, a full on bloody ritual, but I always, I, I use sound therapy. So what I do is I, I use a sound generator and you can just, you can just download it on your, there's like online like tone generators, but I use mm. 432 Hertz. So I'm not sure whether you've ever come across mm. this research before, mm. but it's just yeah. a sound frequency playing. Then I have aromatherapy. So I have like a, it's like, um, like a diffuser. So it, normally I use lemongrass oil or I use, mm. I use lavender, something calming. Depends on how I feel or what type of state I want to get myself into. And so I sit there, I've got the sound therapy, I've got my red light panel. But what I do in the morning is because I don't want red light, I want more blue light. So I use blue light from just natural lighting, but then also infrared light, just, just, okay. to, just to give me a bit of added benefit. So I sit there for 20 minutes so I've got sound, smell, lighting, meditating for 20 minutes, and then I'll get up and start my day. And typically I'll, I'll have a nice breakfast mm. about nine o'clock or so, cup of coffee. I'll have some medicinal mushrooms, maybe some, some CBD oil. 
Okay. Some supplements. One supplement which I'm loving, I didn't know much about till I, I just recently discovered is zeolite. Okay. Have you ever come across zeolite? I have, yeah. 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 I'm really it's loving this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's great yeah. for detox. Yeah. But I, I really love the, the zeolite because I think it just helps to really clear any of these heavy metals. It also modulates yeah. the gut microbiome by knocking out a yeah. lot of negative bugs, removes toxins. Yeah. But I have some other supplements as well. Yeah. I have my milk kefir. Milk kefir, I normally have that with a handful of blueberries some almonds, some Brazil nuts, and bee pollen. Okay, fantastic. And Great. then Sounds I'll have... In... Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, I know. yeah, it sounds incredible. Simple, but uh, Simple. It's with a circadian rhythm, and it's a real food and, and uh, healthy stuff. Yeah, and then I'll literally, after my breakfast, I'll have one more meal for the day, typically around 3 o'clock, and that will be quite a substantial meal. That's like, my, like a, a king's meal. Like it's... Okay. It keeps me full. Like literally, I'll be full for the rest of the night. Okay. I mean, it's it's substantial, and and typically it'll involve some form of. Some, you mentioned prefers. I love uh, I love side mm. westers, okay. mm. a, a piece of grass fed organic steak, organic lamb, but typically I go to seafood as much as I can, specifically for the omega threes. Omega threes are yeah. very important. Oysters yeah. or all the sardines are my go-to, but I'll mix it up. Yeah. And of course, lots of vegetables, lots of diversity in vegetables. And what people don't realize is that diversity in vegetables also includes spices. You have a spice mix. There could mm. be like seven different types of vegetables in that spice mix. I mean, and then you mix up your vegetables and an easy way to get lots of diversity in vegetables is to use fermented vegetables, fermented foods, because they literally sit in your, your fridge for, you could, could be years. Like I have a miso, I have misos that I've made that are two years old. Wow. So I could literally just get a teaspoon of miso and put it on the side of the plate, put some natto, put some tempeh, various types of pickled vegetables, which could just be sitting preserved in my fridge. Mustards, they're all ways to include different types of fibers and different types of plant foods in your diet. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. Brilliant. The worst Brilliant. thing is to just, you just eat the same thing every day. Cause then that's the typical standard diet is where mm. piece of meat and then the same vegetables, carrots, peas, mm. potato. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting okay. diversity in plant food. Brilliant. And uh, I know that I do want to talk about it a, possibly a later podcast because I know we're running out of time and you've been just so gracious, but the carnival code by Dr. Paul Saladino, what's happening, not believing in fiber and saying that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more research in the future, how important eating from nose to tail is making sure that you get enough glycine as well as the methionine that comes from, you know, the, the meat, uh, the, the muscle part of the animal. But I think uh, what I want to finish with is, just uh, I've noticed over many years of dealing with clients, 21 years now in the health space, that the hardest thing is for people to maintain, you know, healthy habits, to maintain sustained transformation. So they start diets and the research shows that 80 to 95% of people who lose weight regain that weight within five years and not, if not more. Give us your top three tips or pieces of advice that help people maintain or sustain their transformation, Kevin. Firstly, I'll say is one of the bits of research that I found that alludes to why people gain the weight back is because the microbiome, again, just like many other reactions in the body and processes in the body, tries to go back to its steady state. So it wants homeostasis. So it wants stability. So what happens is you can have a stable state that's diseased. For instance, you could be a diabetic or you could have obesity and you've got a diseased steady state. So you have to fight against this, this homo, homeostatic effect Great. for the body wanting to just go back. Because remember, the, the bacteria and the yeast and the candidas and all these things in your gut have direct line of communication to the brain via the vagus nerve. So they can signal more sugar 
more X, more Y. So what I suggest for consistent change, we're very fortunate that we can shape the microbiome. We can slowly modulate it. It's not like you can change your heart or change your liver or change your kidneys. It's pretty much stuck with what you genetically have. But the microbiome, you can shift it substantially just by dietary interventions. And that's why things like carnivore or elimination styles of diets, GAPS diet, AIP diet, all these diets that exclude certain things are so powerful because we can shift our microbiome to a point where we start to crave the good things, where the, the, the beneficial bacteria are dominating, the lactobacilli or the, or the acumencia or the, or the bifidobacteria, all the short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria, the ones that are, are dominating versus the negative types of bacteria or, or yeasts. So once we shift it, then the battle is easy. But everybody has to go through those few months of pain <laughs> to go through the elimination, to struggle through the cravings. But again, out of everything, I think diet is probably number three. There's easier ways. Get rid of the, the EMFs. Start to be really mindful of your light exposures. Eat in a shortened window, really a short window, like eight hours, six to eight hours, mm. and just eat really clean food. And I think just by making those changes, you'll then push that, that microbiome state to a new state. And then once it gets to the new steady state, then you can maintain it but you have to go through that short-term pain. Fantastic, Kribben. Thank you so much. Where, where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Where can they listen to you? Well, you've got the Gut Health Gurus podcast, which is on Spotify and Apple and all, the, all that good stuff. And then I'm most active on, on Instagram. For some reason, I just resonate with Instagram. So if you go to Gut Health Gurus on Instagram or you go to Gut Health Gurus on on Facebook, on YouTube, we have the Gut Health Gurus Facebook group, which is now almost 14,000 people from across the wow. world who are just totally obsessed with all things gut health, microbiome, fermented foods. Mm. I've just been so blessed to have a, just a really loving, supportive community of people that can hold your hand and give you lots of advice. So it's free. You can just come and join us. And obviously, then you've got Nourishment Organics. If you're interested in some of our products, we have some of the most novel, revolutionary health products in the world. Mm. So you can come by and check out our fermentation kits, our range of prebiotics, probiotics, fermented foods, anything that's cutting edge, I'm getting on there. I've got this amazing product recently as well. It's a, it's a bioactive hemp oil. Unbelievable. Again, for mental health, it is just unbelievable. Bioactive it's really soothing oil. and calm. Bio, bio, bioactive hemp oil. It's, it's amazing. Okay. All right. Well, tell us a little bit more because it sounds fantastic. We've got hemp oil here, but I don't know what uh, the difference is between the bioactive form and, and just the ordinary hemp that you find in South Africa. It's special. I actually found these guys in, in a conference in Nuga. It's the biggest trade conference in the world in Germany. Just by fluke, I found these guys, I tried their products. But what makes this particular product special is that they go through quite a gentle extraction process of the hemp to get the maximum amount of these bioactive compounds. But why they work so effectively is because there's this entourage effect. So all these different phytocannabinoids and and different compounds work together because there's a nice balanced profile. They're not just trying to isolate certain components. So they, it's very rounded in the way they, okay. they react in the body and specifically the endocannabinoid systems in the gut. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, very soothing to the body. It, it's very, if you, if you suffer from any form of anxiety and depression, just a little bit of this stuff under the tongue I use it on a daily basis. It's very common and very, very powerful for gut health. Inflammation, if you've got soreness of joints in the body, especially after working out for training, DOMS, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness, you can rub it on topically. Very powerful product. I was, I was 
very surprised at how effective it actually was trying it myself. We'll get uh, the connection to Nourish Me Organics for the Made to Thrive community, especially in this crazy corona time with anxiety and depression on the exponential increase, people sitting behind laptops, the blue light, the EMFs, really not getting out like they used to. I think uh, there's going to be a huge need for uh, someone like Kribin Govender and Nourish Me Organics to get out there with these amazing products. So we'll just put the links in the show notes. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your calling. You, you inspire me, uh, Steve uh, Stabs here in South Africa. It's the first time we've met, but uh, you're an inspiration. You motivate me to get out there and really declare these things that we've been speaking about. There's just so much value and so much information in this podcast. So send us your queries and your comments and uh, we'll put all the links. So thank you so much, Kribben. Uh, I pour favor and blessing upon your life that you go from strength to strength. And uh, I know it's getting dark that side of Melbourne, yes, so sweet. I'm grateful that I'm we, we, no problem. <laughs> we, we're breaking some circadian rhythmicity hey. here, but thank you. I My appreciate pleasure, it. My pleasure, man. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Great. Take care. Thanks so much. Eh? Kribben, thanks so much for that. I really appreciate